maybe I, I, I tell you a story. I, I completely agree with the, what Jan Bosch said, but I think he was thinking about whole stuff a bit too narrow. Uh, but 200 years ago, we had a revolution. This was the revolution of production machinery. Now we have a revolution, which is a revolution of information machinery. And you can discuss which of these revolutions is more significant, what is more severe. I was leading a study uh, about seven years ago for the German Academy of Technical Sciences, ACATEC, about cyber physical systems. And there we try to understand all the stuff coming, and we are in between now, the speed is very fast. And we developed for a number of application area scenarios, including production. And a few of my colleagues who listened to the results of our study said, oh, that's an interesting stuff, let's call it Industry 4.0. And now the whole world talks about Industry 4.0. But as I said to Jan, for me the interesting part of what's going on is not only what happens to economy or what happens to the companies. The interesting story is what happens to society, what happens to us, because it's really going to change us. So digital transformation is much more than looking at economy. It's looking at all types of things involved, and it is run by digital technology. And we just heard a very interesting example. 5G is a good example of the fast development of technology. And it's also an example of infrastructure, because 5G will be part of our infrastructure. And it's important also to look at the development and uses of digital applications because the technology and the infrastructure is only interesting if we run applications and, of course, digital business models. And it will be changing economy and industry, but it will also change society, politics, science, education and private life. I am currently the founding, pre founding president of the Bavarian Center of Digitization and we try to understand what's going on there and also try to understand what we can do. We means the government of Bavaria. Uh, and to keep it very simple, because you can talk for a long time about those stuff, you can separate things in a number of sections. One section is digital technology. We have heard about that. To keep it short, it's hardware and software. Uh, the next thing is digital infrastructure. And there's a lot of digital infrastructure already around. Devices, embedded systems, networks, 5G will be part of our digital infrastructure. And it's so important. Why is it so important? Because now, according to the amount of digital infrastructure around, we can run a number of applications without changing anything in the physical world. We just change something in the software world, a new app. If it's interesting, it's around the world within a few days. And I think this is remarkable. Uh, and we have those digital applications, and the applications are literally everywhere. There is no subject which is not affected by that. Leads us to business opportunities, to the rapid change of business, and Jan was talking about that. I'm a little bit more skeptical than he. Perhaps uh, is there is, are some issues which will really make us believe that we have the best of all worlds now, but of course there are a number of things to think about, and they are also, all the political stuff is related to digital technology. The interesting question is, would Trump have been elected without digital technology? And it's not so clear. And we will see how these technology will change the life of individuals in their behavior, in their understanding of the world, and that relates to education and a lot of other stuff. And the dynamics of what's going on results from the intensive mutual reinforcement of these different fields. Who will be transformed? Well, the individuals, the economy, the education, the science, the technology, the environment, the society, state politics and government, literally everything. Um, we have heard 
a lot about the change of economy, so I can be short, short about that. We have really innovative functionality. We work a lot with cars in Bavaria. We have large car uh, manufacturers in our country. And if you study what's happening to cars within the last 50 years, you know what I mean. The first little piece of software came into cars exactly 50 years ago. It was on ignition systems, it was done by Bosch, and it was very, very small. And then we have seen in a number of steps, and I'm not going to explain the steps, that cars go on and on and on, and they become really driving computers. And today, I would say one third of the development work in the car industry is computer science, is informatics. And this is true not only for cars, it's true for nearly all other fields. And we have this modular value change and this automation and all the scaling effects which Jan was talking about. Let's shortly look at the drivers of technology. You know this gentleman? His name is Gordon Moore. He invented the first integrated circuit. He started the company Intel, and he developed what is called Moore's Law today. Actually, it's not a law, it's an observation. And the observation was true for a long time and will be true for some time. Nobody really knows how long. I think you will have a presentation at the end of this day on Moore's Law and how long it will survive. But it's interesting to look at that. And to look at that, it means that I just look at the computing power computing power increases by a factor of two every one and a half year. And it's an easy calculation to find out that it means that we have a factor of 100 of increase within 10 years. And these numbers look very innocent, but what it really means can be translated into what you can observe if you look, for instance, at cars. If you take a, an average car today, say a VW Golf, then it might have 100 uh, horsepowers. And if we would have the same increase in power within, uh, in, within 10 years, it would cost the same as today and would be have 10,000 horsepowers. Then you see how this technology develops. And this is true for networks too, and it's true for devices to store stuff. But it would be nothing without software. And software is really able to build a lot of interesting applications. Maybe the biggest machine which was ever built by a human being is our telephone system. And it's interesting to see that after we had the internet and after we had the World Wide Web, only a few people with not much money built Skype. And Skype is an application which offers you everything. A telephone offers you, and even a bit more, because you can have images of the people you are talking to. And there you see the flexibility of software. And all these things together makes this enormous speed. And then we if we look at technologies, we see things like data processing, embedded system, personalized computation, high-performance computing, search engines, mobile communication, data analytics, and now autonomous systems more and more, and you see the areas of application. And then you understand the dynamics, what's going on here. And there's an interesting observation. Uh, I just uh, quote Latour here. Change the instruments and it will change the entire social theory that goes with them. So the changes that come from the digital technology, from the digital revolution, will change our whole society, including the social theory that goes with them. And you can observe that. And therefore, the question whether we are the best of the worlds you can think of is an interesting one, but we have to discuss it not with only looking at business and not only looking at the technical possibilities, but looking at what are the results of all that. What are the drivers, the application? I think you know that, then I can be very short. Uh, we have the internet and we have the World Wide Web and it permits an access to a worldwide uh, sea of knowledge. Actually, it's interesting that nobody was foreseeing the internet and nobody was foreseeing the World Wide Web. There were a number of future scientists which were thinking about the future 
of technology, but nobody was thinking about the World Wide Web. It came out of the blue, more or less. And the World Wide Web is a sea of information, as I said, and we have seen a number of developments, social networks, with a lot of impact, not just to business, but also to society. We see more and more of the semantic web, which means interpretation of the information you find there, which traditionally was only interpreted in a syntactic way, and more and more is interpreted in a semantic way. We have already the future internet today, after 10 years of smartphones, and we go more and more in the internet of things and services, we say the internet of Dinge in Germany. And the Internet of Things, we have heard about that. It's a simple idea. Everything gets connected to the Internet. Why is that? Well, because it's very convenient. If you, if you connect a light bulb to the Internet, it means that you can control it. Maybe you can get prediction whether it will get into a trouble in, a f in some time, and you can know whether it has trouble, whether it has a defect. And therefore, we will see a lot of devices connected to the internet. And this already changes the world because if somebody has a connection of the light bulb to the internet, he gets data. So he gets data when the light is on and off and then he knows information about the people using that light bulb. So it's a, it's a, it's a technical development but it will change the whole society. Here you see a number of predictions how much uh, devices will be connected to the internet. Uh, some people talk about 50 billions. I've seen uh, estimations about 200 billions. It doesn't really matter whether it's 20 or 50 or 200 billions. It's quite clear that this is a development we will see. And so a lot of the things which I mentioned here will be connected to the Internet. And from the Internet of Things, we will go on to the cyber-physical systems. What's the difference between the Internet of Things? I don't like the term Internet of Things a lot, because the interesting thing is not to connect things to the Internet. The interesting thing is to connect systems to the Internet. What is the difference between a thing and a system? Well, a system has software itself, and therefore a system can both use services of the Internet in a much more clever way, and at the same time interact with the Internet in a much more interesting way. And so we will see that our Internet gets real world aware. What does that mean? Well, it will get information in real time out of the physical world, and therefore can use this information to do a lot of things. And we have seen already many things of that. Uh, advanced systems is an example. We see in the cars today adaptivity. I remember when we first discussed in research projects with our car uh, industry partners, they said adaptive system in a car, never, no way. Today they are completely convinced that this is the right direction to go. We talk about autonomy not just in cars, also it's interesting to talk about autonomy in media, autonomy in, in, the, in, in the internet. Uh, we talk about real-time access from devices. We have seen in the 5G that we are developing uh, devices that will be able to react very, very fast um, over wireless LAN connections and over the internet. We will see sensors and actuators everywhere and the human in the loop. My son just came back from China and I talked to him the other day and he said, it's interesting to see how China developed. It's also interesting to see how much sensors, how much video cameras, everything is in the public. And it means that a, a, a country like China can observe nearly everything in public over the internet. And this means that you have maybe read the book 1984. What you, is written there is completely different what we see today. But the possibilities we see today are beyond what is in the book. And of course, the interesting stuff there is the human in the loop. We will see that these devices are closer to the human being than any other thing we have seen before. And so we see the cyber-physical systems, the systems that interact with the Internet, 
and we will see that these cyber-physical systems uh, make sure that the uh, internet becomes real world and the embedded systems get connected to cloud services. And that means that even today we have not one system, we have a lot of systems and all are connected. So we have a huge global general systems and we will see no devices which are not connected to other devices. And since connectivity is transient, it will be connected to everything. And an issue, as you know, is security. Security is an unsolved problem. And a lot of the experts in the field, if you listen carefully, say there is no solution. So we will live in a world with a lot of digital devices and we will not have a perfect security. Maybe it's not so bad because this is how life is. There is no perfect security anyway. But we have to understand what this means in protecting data protecting against digital attacks, protecting critical infrastructure, protecting privacy. And we have to discuss at which moment we apply the technology and we take the risk, and whether there are situations where we don't apply technology because we want to take the risk. So we are in the challenges. Well, we are in Europe here. One of the big challenges is that Europe is very weak in internet technology. Uh, here I have the numbers of the leading companies that control the internet. And if you look at the companies here, you have Google, you have Microsoft, you have Facebook, you have Yahoo, you have Wikimedia Foundation, you have Amazon. Here you have an uh, Asian company. So if you look at all the companies, they are just North American companies on the top. And if you go a little bit down, you find a number of Asian companies, and we all expect these Asian companies will, will step by step get higher here. There is no European company. What does that mean? It's not so clear at all, but it means that at least in one part of digital technology, which is very, very important, and that's general connectivity and general infrastructure, in the World Wide Web of Information, Europe has a very, very weak position. Let's just talk about other key information, uh, innovation drivers. Well, the real world integrates part of the cyberspace. I'm quite convinced that our children and our grandchildren, they will, do, they will not see a lot of difference between digital technology in the real world. Digital technology is part of the real world. Digital technology will be very closely connected with the real world. So embedded systems are part uh, of physical use data and services from the internet. Embedded systems will be closely integrated with cyberspace. System of systems with the internet as integration platforms, we will see a lot of augmented reality and the fusion of the digital and the physical world. And it's on the way. And I already met, mentioned human factors, the human in the loop. It's interesting if you look at these wonderful devices, and for me as a guy who worked in computer science for quite a while, and when I started to, start, uh, to, to write my first programs, that's already 40 years ago, or more than 40 years ago, for us, a device like this would be like magic. If you would have given me such a device 40 years ago, I would believe this is impossible. So we have seen a development which is really unbelievable. And now if you look at the way people make use of these devices, it's interesting because you realize that these devices are very close to the people. The people consider these devices as part of themselves, as part of their personality. There are interesting studies. If you take away the smartphone from a user, the user finds this as a loss, like amputation. So <coughs> in, a some, in some sense, we are already cyborgs. We use these devices in a way as they would be part of our body. And that will go on. We will have augmented human identity by digital technology. 
And of course, there are a lot of engineering challenges. It would be a pleasure to talk a long time about that because I'm an informatic guy. So I could talk about architectures and I could talk about requirements engineering and uh, how you do the data analytics on the dependability. I just wanted to mention, because this is over, often overlooked, if you look at the successful companies, and that was more or less the message of Jan Bosch, if you look at the successful companies, they all understand how to do software engineering and systems engineering. And they understand how to do the human factors, because if you look at the smartphone, how it was invented by Apple, one of the real interesting stuff is not only the technical integration there, one of the real interesting stu stuff is how it is adapted to what people find easy to use. And the first time <laughs> you see, as my granddaughter is doing, when she goes to the television and she wants to have a new station, she goes to the television and makes like this, and is very disappointed that it doesn't work. Because this is a kind of a paradigm she finds perfect and should work everywhere. And so we have now a deep impact on human behavior with those devices. It has to do with acceptance, it has to do with human social media networks, and it has to do with integrated socio-cyber-physical systems. And a, an, an interesting professional example is air traffic control. If you study how a pilot today does his job, it's an interesting uh, di division of responsibility between the embedded system in the airplane, the pilot, and the air tra traffic control. And if a if the system realizes that the pilot has cognitive overload, it takes over. And that's one of the reasons we have not a lot of accidents in air traffic. And we will see this in other areas as well. Software will be everywhere. Data will be collected from everywhere. And we have the characteristics of digitization. And I don't have the time to explain all that stuff to you. I just wanted to show you that there are a number of principles which, if you understand them, you understand how digital technology works. I mentioned Moore's law. We mentioned the high speed, and one of the rules is die fast. If something works, it's fine. If it doesn't work, get away with it. Go away from it. Scaling, minimal transaction cost. We have this, this saying of the winner takes it all. Availability, always on. Unlocalized, everywhere. Disruptive change, survival of the creative. Paradigm shift, software is eating the world. Access to resources more important than ownership. Sharing economy, new business models. Innovative forms of cooperation, digital ecosystems, networking, platform companies, and gratis economy, zero marginal costs. And these are the driving factors which make it happen that we have a situation we never had before in, in, in the economy of the world. So some of the most expensive companies, or I should say all of the most expensive companies, and just take Google. How old is Google? less than 20 years. And it's the largest, the most expensive companies, company of the world. We had never that before, that, that a company can get within 20 years the most expensive company. And this is the explanation. Because these are the driving forces of digital economy. And what are the key issues? Software is key technology. If you look at how Google does software technology, you understand what I mean. Google does not employ a person, even if they use, if they look for a financial officer who is not able to program. They take it really serious. And software is understood not only at Google, at all levels more and more as key technology. Functionality, platform, application, nets, development, dependability. The mastering of software technology is, to, is central for innovation and as a competition, competition success factor. And again, in a way that we understand that digital technology is closer to the human than any other technology before. 
and uh, net internet enterprises have a more direct contact to the customers how no one else. This is another thing European companies did not understand for a long time and even some of them do not understand it today. If you buy a car, and this is, a, this is the same for a sub, uh, a sub car or Volvo or uh, a, a German car, if you buy a car, you never talk to the production company of the car. You buy it, you buy it from a car shop and you drive it five years and you never talk to the company that produced the car. It's ridiculous. Talk about Google. You never bought anything from Google, but you talk to Google every day. In Germany, 95% of the people use Google as their major, the most interesting search engine. And they use it five, ten times a day. And therefore, Google knows exactly what the people are interested in. And they can do experiments every time they want to. And so, human-centered engineering is the success factor when you understand how to use software. And here, I will not go into details due to lack of time, you can do a SWOT analysis for informatics in Europe. Since I'm responsible for the development of digital technology in Bavaria, we are very careful with this SWOT analysis. We want to understand what are our strengths, what is our weaknesses, and what are the opportunities and what are the threats. And it's an interesting way to look at that and to understand what we can do. I will not go into details here, I just wanted now to discuss consequences for informatics for computer science. First of all, we have to go from software to systems engineering. Why? When I started programming, the computers were in locked rooms, in labs. Nobody else could touch it besides the computer scientists. Nobody was really interested in those. And we were do programming, and programming was completely different from the physical world. We were doing isolated experiments with those. Nowadays, we go from conventional sequential algorithms to interactive processes. The systems are not only directed to the physical world, everybody is carrying those stuff with them. And we may have to go from abstract, discrete digital modeling to real world modeling. And what does this mean, interaction? probabilistic understanding of software, understanding time, understanding continuous input, topology and geography, context and human behavior. We are part of our reality. And so we have to understand reality and how to model those effects in our discipline. So the task of computer science, of informaticians, changes from the design of programs on standalone computers and the solution of medium-sized problems by programming to the development of huge software systems connected to the physical world, to data and services in networks, in close interaction to users. Informaticians become designers of digital future worlds and they are part of the strategic leadership in enterprises. Are they? Well, they are in the huge US companies, but in European companies it's not true. And this is in addition to what Jan was talking about. If we want to change the companies, we have to change the way these companies are led. And so we need management, we need strategic leaders in those companies which understand software, which understand business, and which understand hopefully also a bit of society and politics. And so the role of informaticians changes from specialists for, uh, for algorithms and data, for programs and software, to domain experts, partners for the system design, to designers of new business models, to strategists, found of startups, well, to entrepreneurs. So what has changed? Informatics is a scientific discipline with perhaps the highest economic impact currently. Disruptive changes of the old economy, we've heard that. It has a lot of economic impact of subfields that is so high that companies have to take over these fields. This is another, another interesting observation. Uh, 
it is about to change our scientific paradigms. If you look at fields like machine learning or robotics, we see that some companies, in particular US companies, are trying to get all the experts in the world because they believe having these experts brings them into a leading position in business. And that means that science is taken away from universities. How can a university and even the best universities in the world cope with a Google or an Amazon when they have 200, 300, 500 specialists in machine learning? If they have people that don't have to teach <laughs> and they don't have to do stupid administrative processes, but can concentrate on this technology and to apply these technologies. And that will change. And we in computer science see that these technologies have a very, very short time until they are relevant to the business. And that changes, of course, the scientific patterns to a large extent. As I said, Digital transformation is not only about economies, but also about politics. If you look at bots, and if you look at fake news, you see what I mean. Our media field is completely changing. And therefore, we have to understand how digital technology changes that, and we have to understand the technology to understand what it means to democracy, democracy and to sociological structures. Digital technology is changing the way people organize their everyday life and their social relationships. And it can revolutionize our education systems. I talk a lot with teachers these days, and I see that the schools are more or less, there are some exceptions, some experiments, but if you take away these experiments, our schools are more or less like the schools were before digital technology was coming. How do you organize education in a situation where information is in the network every time you want it? And unfortunately, there is very good information there. I always use it. But it's also a lot of bad information there. And you have to learn how to deal with that. And that's what schools have to teach. And if you teach that, you have to teach, can teach much less in other ways. Digital technology makes significantly influence the political and military power in a rapidly changing world and the role of third world countries. If you look at the migration processes we have seen over the last five to ten years, they were to a large extent also related to digital technology. Two just little points to that. First of all, digital technology allows people in underdeveloped countries to have a much better understanding how developed countries look like. Or I should say, how developed countries look like over the internet. Which is not exactly what they are really looking like. And at the same time, it would be interesting to have a deep study how the migration streams were changed and controlled by all the, all the traffic in the internet. And uh, this is just one example. Um, these digital technologies will develop systems that overrule people and determine the work and leisure situation. It brings in new threats related to cybersecurity. So how do we respond? I think academic informatics has to shape the interaction into interdisciplinary work. Faculty business is no longer the right way to do that. We have to update our curricula in the new topics, provide some counterpart to the booming economy, educate our students to be prepared for the economic leadership, to understand the digital revolution and their impact. We have to learn how to give advice to politics and enterprise management. They don't know. So we have to contribute to the public discussion and we have to develop an ethical position. I have the pleasure to be part of a group in Germany which was uh, asked by the German Minister of Traffic 
to develop an ethical po po position for autonomous driving. And I can tell you, it's not easy. So we have to develop a philosophy of science for informatics. And I think we are really feeling the winds of change. You know Bob Dylan? He got a, a famous prize last year, and he has a very nice song. And he says, then you better start swimming or we'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manfred. I was hoping you would sing. <laughs> 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 but maybe later if you stay on to the mingle. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, you were talking about the changes for academia, but I was also wondering, we've been discussing during the day cross-disciplinary, uh, the intersection between disciplines and, and sciences. Yeah. How, could you just say a word about that, how you think yeah, academia I, I, is coping I, I with that? I said half a sentence already, but I can go a little bit deeper. Mm. What, I, what I observe is, and I just discussed it also with, uh, uh, in, in the break, what I observe is that we are now in the situation that over the last years, uh, digital technology is so important for other faculties that we have two observations. One observation is now computer science mirrors what's going on in all the other faculties because they are studying these different applications. And at the same time, of course, other fields say, oh, computer science brings in completely new challenges, so we take over computer science to a certain extent. So we double, so to speak, the faculties, and which is ridiculous. I think the faculty structure is not very good in dealing with digital technologies. And so we have to think about how to organize universities much more effectively, mm -hmm. such that people work together. If you look at companies, and when I try to help them to go into the digital age, uh, we always make sure that they develop an organization where they have a tight interaction between experts in digital technologies and the application fields. And I think universities should do the same. Mm. Good. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, I'm, as a consultant in my day-to-day -day work, I work with public sector development. Okay. And when I have universities as clients, they are based on how universities are built, and which is great, but they're also one of the most siloed and most difficult organizations to change when yeah, it comes but to that's an easy drive explanation. innovation. What are the oldest organizations in the world? Churches. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the second oldest? Universities. And judges, and the, and the, the legal system. Yeah, yeah, I, I compare, I compare yeah, these, yeah. those three. So, yeah. anyone else who wants to challenge me with a question? Me to give to Manfred, of course, I mean. Please, go ahead. Hello, do you want to start from Meridian working with uh, supply chain and manufacturing? Um, so, uh, I heard you were involved in the industry 4.0 in Germany. I was just looking on your feeling on the response from the manufacturing part of Europe to industry 4.0. Are you happy or content? Or what would you see as the next step to get us in line? Well, uh, actually, I was not so happy about this notion of Industry 4.0, because a lot of people were understanding Industry 4.0 as a digitization of production. And that's much too narrow. I think we have to digitize production, yes, and it gives a lot of additional possibilities, but the real revolution is not there. The real revolution of the digital transformation is not in production. It's in the way people use services, in the way products change, in the way the power changes. If, if, you, if you look at uh, what's going on today, look at Uber. It's a company which owns, it's not completely true, but literally it owns no car, but it runs the largest taxi service of the world. And you can see an, a, a number of other examples. So our economic system is completely changing. And all the leading companies, Amazon, Google, Apple, no, well, it's not true, but uh, Facebook are not production companies. They do not produce anything in the classical production way. 
And therefore, I believe that Industry 4.0 is misleading because it focuses on the wrong questions. Yeah, sorry, my question was basically, what was the response? Because we know all this about the, the Facebook and the Googles, uh, which are innovative and are driving this change and are using the new technology. Mm -hmm. But are the manufacturing part, which might also be an important part of the European labor force in the future, do they also embrace this new technology? Well, I believe it's in so far interesting for Europe because now the human workforce is not so much important anymore, but this was already true a few years ago before people were talking about digitization. And what I believe is interesting is not just digital production, but digital engineering. To, to have the whole process of product development in the computer and related to the production process and related to services around it. I think this is a very interesting topic to think about and this is the development which I see. And of course it's completely related and Jan was talking a little bit about that to data, collecting data and using data in this process. Thank you. We have room for one short question and one short answer. Anyone up for the task? Ivica. Yes, uh, uh, about uh, education. Do you think that the informatics would be like uh, mathematics in the future? So, some general principle valid for everything and it's like basics and you just use it. <laughs> as, as you know, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, some people in the US talk about the new literacy and they believe that we should teach all pupils programming. It's an interesting question. It's, for me, it's not so clear whether this is true. I think we should have, we teach all, uh, uh, all people, all ch children, that they understand the basics of digital technology. And not because we have digital technology in everyday life, but also because it helps a lot to structure thinking, to solve problems. And therefore, I think there is some basics which you can teach. And it's a bit related to mathematics, but it's different because it's not just about numbers. And therefore, I believe, yes, we should do that. But there's a second part of education. This is what I mentioned. In a world of devices that handle information, you have to learn how to find your way there. And finding your way there means that you have to learn much less in other parts. And I think school has not realized that really so far. It will please you then to hear that uh, just last week the Swedish uh, government proposed and that we're going to actually teach programming from young ages in school. So uh -huh, okay. <laughs> we're getting there, we're getting there. Okay. <laughs> and with that, a big thank you, Manfred. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, my magic oh, 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 pocket, oh, oh, oh. I've got some chocolate. <laughs> okay, thank thanks you very much. Thank you. <laughs>